Philosophy has often been seen as a hunt for a theory of everything, a single grand narrative that explains it all. In recent times, science has had its own supporters for a theory of everything. Yet, no theory of everything in philosophy or science is forthcoming. And is it even possible? It would have to, after all, include itself. Can we conceive of a universe that also includes its causes and its laws? Can a universe have no before or after, no outside? And isn't a theory of everything itself bounded by its particular culture, its language and its mode of thinking? So should we abandon the dream of a theory of everything, simply see it as an illusion born of a hubris? Is the mistake not with the idea of a full explanation, but with the idea of everything, or as the Greeks would have said, the one? Or is it just possible that, as Stephen Hawkins once believed, a theory of everything is just around the corner? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Professor Catherine Haymans. I am the Astronomer Royal for Scotland, and it is my great pleasure tonight to host The End of Everything. And we will be answering the question, should we abandon the dream of a theory of everything? I have four amazing speakers uh, with me this evening. Um, we have Eric Weinstein. He is an American podcast host. He is the managing director of Teal Capital, uh, one of the founding members of the intellectual dark web and a doctor of mathematical physics. His geometric unity theory of everything has been both praised and criticized by the academic community. Sabina Hosenfelder is a theoretical physicist at Frankfurt Institute of Advanced Studies. She specializes in quantum gravity. She's also a best-selling author and look out for her new book this summer, Existential Physics, A Scientist's Guide to Life's Biggest Questions. Uh, Sabina also has a very popular YouTube channel. Check it out, Science Without the Gobbledygook. We have Brian Green, a professor of mathematics and physics at the University of Columbia. He is both famous for his groundbreaking discoveries in string theory and his best-selling books, the most recent of which is entitled Until the End of Time, Mind, Matter, and Our Search for Meaning in an Evolving Universe. And finally, last but by no means least, Michael Shermer, science writer, historian, founder of the Skeptic Society and editor-in-chief of its magazine, Skeptic. Uh, he is also a best-selling author. Uh, his recent book, Giving the Devil His Due, uh, explores uh, the concepts of free speech and interestingly ideas of controversial intellectuals. I wonder if we will be controversial enough for you this evening, Michael. Um, <laughs> I am going to invite all of my speakers uh, to answer a question for me. The question is, is it possible to find a theory of everything? They have two minutes each and we're going to start off with Brian Green. Brian, is it possible to find a theory of everything? Well, I should say at the outset that I am not a fan of the phrase theory of everything because the number of issues that it raises, some of which you summarize in your opening remarks quite well, are enormous. And it also, from a sociological standpoint, makes an odd statement within the community. If you say that you're working on the theory of everything and someone's not working on it or something like it, then what are they working on? Nothing? And so it's, 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 not a, it's not a good phrasing to use, even though it is quite commonplace. Instead, I think a better phrasing is the search for ever deeper principles that unify our understanding of the world. And by that, I simply mean you could explain the world by simply giving a list of all of the physical facts about the world. It would be a very unwieldy explanation of the world. It wouldn't give you much insight at all. So that's why that's typically not the approach we take. Instead, we try to find patterns in the world, encapsulate those patterns in physical law, and then be able to describe a wealth of phenomenon from a few principles. And the smaller the number of principles and the greater the range of phenomena we can describe, the better and more potent we consider our explanations. And historically, that's exactly what has happened, even if that wasn't initially the motivation, right? I mean, Isaac Newton showed that physics here on Earth and physics up there in the sky are all governed by the same basic law of gravity. And then you've got Maxwell and, and others in the 1800s showing that electricity and magnetism, Faraday, come together into a unified theory of electricity and magnetism. They're deeply related patterns that put things together. Einstein comes along and shows us that space and time that we thought were distinct, they're actually 
unified in the special theory of relativity. And then he puts gravity into that mix with the general theory of relativity. And you fast forward into the 60s and 70s and scientists, Abdus Salam and Glashow and Weinberg put together one of the nuclear forces, the weak nuclear force with electricity and magnetism unifying them into one theoretical structure called the electroweak theory. And so this pattern of unification, smaller number of principles, greater explanatory reach has been what we've seen played out. The big question is, will this continue? Right. I mean, in America, when you invest in some kind of fund, they always say, you know, past results are not indicative of future success. The same may be true here. Right. But certainly we're going to have to put gravity and quantum mechanics together. That next stage of unity, I think, is pretty uncontroversial that it needs to happen. Whether we have it now or not is debatable and worth discussing. But whether this then categorizes or should be described as a theory of everything, no, it's not a theory of everything. It would be a theory of the fundamental ingredients, the fundamental laws that describe them. It's a much less ambitious approach to understanding the world. Uh, Sabina, is it possible to find a theory of everything? Well, I I wouldn't say it's impossible, but uh, I think it's not something I'm going to see in my lifetime. Uh, Though I should put ahead that, like Brian, uh, I'm not a fan of the phrase theory of everything because it raises a lot of uh, thorny issues and people tend to misunderstand it. Physicists who work in the foundations of physics mean something very specific by a theory of everything, um, which is a unified description of all the fundamental forces of nature that we currently know of, which besides gravity are the three forces uh, in the standard model. And so we have those four forces, they kind of sit a little bit awkward next to each other. And one of the big thorny questions is, um, why is gravity not a quantum uh, force? Uh, and that discrepancy has to be resolved somehow. So so the quantization of gravity is part of this theory of everything, uh, but also physicists would like all these forces to come out of one simple uh, prescription. Now, um, the question whether such a theory would, theory would actually explain everything, um, I think no one really knows. It's generally assumed that if we had succeeded in uh, unifying those forces, that would also explain some of the puzzles that we have, like, for example, what is dark matter, what what is dark energy. Uh, It would resolve singularities, it would explain what happens inside of black holes. Whether such a theory actually would do this, uh, we don't know. And I'm I'm very skeptical that any of the current approaches to such a theory of everything um, will actually work. Uh, the the reason is quite simply that none of those theories ever address what in my mind is the biggest problem. That's the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. So none of those theories would actually explain what a detector is. And I, and I would say, well, if you have a theory of everything that doesn't tell me what a detector is, that's a poor theory of everything because a detector is clearly something. Now, when it comes to those more philosophical questions, like can a theory actually explain itself? Uh, I think I'm not the right person to ask. Well, we will come on to that, Sabina. Thank you very much. Um, Eric, please do unmute yourself and tell us, is it possible to find a theory of everything? Since I've addressed this elsewhere, let me just say yes, so that we can uh, have more time for the debate. And that's, of course, up to the caveats about uh, not being able to compute everything from it. So thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Eric. And finally, uh, Michael Sherman, is it possible to find a theory of everything? Oh, I'll take Eric's one and a half minutes left. <laughs> I think so in the physical sciences, from a history of science perspective, it seems that's the direction uh, that physicists uh, are moving, uh, given Brian's caveats. Uh, from there, probably not, uh, because so much of the biological and social sciences uh, deal with emergent properties that are not predictable and cannot be derived out of uh, sort of reductionistic, uh, more fundamental principles. So say, take Darwin's theory of evolution, which is the closest we have in the biological sciences to a theory of everything. But even there, there's so many wrinkles on it. And applying it to, say, Darwinian medicine or evolutionary psychology, it's still much of human behavior is quite unpredictable because it, it it's emergent from other phenomenon that are not directly 
likely derived from these more fundamental principles. And if you move to the social sciences and you say, well, where is, where, where can we, how do we explain unemployment? So the economist studies unemployment, where is unemployment in, in, in any kind of physics or biological theories? It's not. Uh, or the study of human conflict or violence or deaths of despair, opioid crisis, uh, it, you, you know, you name it, all of these things uh, have to be studied as emergent properties of their own. There's not going to be any theory of everything because in most cases, you're lucky if you can reduce it to half a dozen variables controlling for all these others. And even there, prediction is extremely difficult. So that said, I think there is an appeal to it because it, it feels like you're moving into almost a theological realm of, you know, we'll, we'll know the mind of God, you know, and when Stephen Hawking wrote that, you know, of course, theologians went crazy, like, ah, the great Stephen Hawking supports us. So I have a whole book on this subject of, of called The Borderlands of Science, in which I talk about theories of everything, including a fellow. So these pe people send me these theories pretty much every month I get them. I have filed cabinets full of theories of everything. These are not the kind of stuff that Eric and, and Brian and Sabina are working on. The, the, this guy writes, by the way, he has the URL www.theoryofeverything.com. So sorry, it's been taken. <laughs> And uh, so I always write these people back and say, well, why don't you try uh, uh, talking to a physicist about this? And like this guy then responded, I sent it to many scientists, but nobody interested so far. And many of them said, boy, don't be stupid. Nobody can discover such a theory. A theory of everything is too crazy. It's impossible. It would be like knowing the mind of God. If you're not interested, please don't write me anymore. Spare me your critical view. So God to me is logic. Therefore, God to me is the law of logic and so on. So I have hundreds of these kinds of things. There's an appeal to it. Like if I can get this, then I, I'm going to be the next Einstein or Feynman or Newton or whatever. And, and, and so it most likely, of course, none of these are true. But I, I think beyond the physical sciences, it's probably a fruitless uh, endeavor. Thank you very much, Michael. So you can see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, a kind of a range of opinions there on what a theory of everything is, whether it's possible, whether it's not. And our first theme for our debate this evening is, would a theory of everything answer all our fundamental questions about the universe, including the existence of the theory itself? And uh, we're going to start off with Brian uh, to answer this question. Well, again, I've already given my misgivings about thinking in terms of the theory of everything at all, so I won't retread that particular answer. But I think Michael's comment is a fertile place to begin an answer to that question, because in many ways, I agree with what Michael just mentioned. There are all sorts of phenomena that happen at a variety of scales in the world. Right, we physicists, or at least we particle physicists, tend to focus upon the electrons, the quarks, the fundamental constituents, and the fundamental laws that govern their behaviors. But when you have a lot of particles come together into a macroscopic system, there are behaviors that emerge in that system that would be very hard to explain at the level of the fundamental particles. I mean, even a simple thing as a baseball flying in a baseball game, if you were to describe it in terms of the motion of the individual constituents, it'd be this mountain of data describing each and every particle, and it would give no insight. Much more useful is to describe it as a baseball flying through the air in the way that, say, Isaac Newton would have described that kind of an object. So it's important to recognize that the world is striated into a variety of scales. There's phenomena that happens at different scales, and what we found is it's best to use the variables and the ideas that are most relevant to the scale of the question being asked. Baseball or human beings, you don't want to answer in terms of particles, but you talk about the spectrum of hydrogen when it's excited, then yeah, you do want to be right down there at the quantum mechanical level and describe in terms of particles. Now, the one thing I would add to that though, and I don't know if this is controversial or if Michael or others would find this controversial. I would take exception to one thing that Michael said. I would say that emergent phenomena in principle are determined by the fundamental laws that govern the basic ingredients. I don't think there's anything else beyond the fundamental ingredients, ingredients and the fundamental laws. It's extraordinarily difficult and largely a fool's errand to try to describe unemployment using the standard model of particle physics, of course. 
But is there something else beyond the particles? And the laws, no. So in principle, if you follow the particles and you follow the laws, and you could do an unimaginable calculation that we can't possibly do, but in principle, would you know that a certain collection of particles at some particular point in time exhibited a behavior that we would call being unemployed? Yeah, yeah, in principle, yes. In principle needs to be underscored for a variety of different reasons. But I don't think there's anything else that intervenes beyond the ingredients in the laws. Okay, so you just need to define those ingredients and then everything else follows. In principle, yes. What else would yeah, there I be? Don't know if, yeah. What else would there be? Not not any ghost of the machine, no external uh, extra sensory or supernatural powers intervening, no. But um, if the universe is not predetermined, we live in a determined universe with cause and effect, but not predetermined, then the outcome is not predictable, in, not even in principle. Not even Laplace's demon that knows every particle and every motion and so forth can predict. Well, what does that, what does that mean? Not, can effect. you just clarify what you mean? Again, in principle, there's a quantum mechanical calculation that won't predict what will happen, but will predict the right. probability of what will happen. And then, as Sabina mentioned, there is this issue of the quantum measurement problem that is unresolved. I agree with what Sabina said completely. That's the missing piece. But if you put that to the side just for having this conversation, I would say that the probabilities are in principle determined by the collection of particles that are engaged in whatever macroscopic system you're talking about. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. this kind of touches on almost the, the free will determinism problem. Oh, see here again, a big I, impact yeah. from free will. Yeah. It doesn't exist. Yeah. So if you just take like an opioid addiction, you could drill down to the molecular level of synaptic transmissions of, of uh, you know, neurochemical transmitter substances and how they're affected by uh, cocaine or whatever. And, and then from there, scale up. But at some point, it seems to me that the system is so complex and the person himself or herself is an active agent within the causal net of the universe. And at some point just decides I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go left instead of right. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, control my addiction or I'm not. And we know some people can do this and some can't. So it's not that it's determined in the future that we already know exactly if we knew every particle, which, which every, every person that would be an addict and, and which are not that in fact, there's an element of volition in there of knowing what the causal vectors are and what you can do to control the forthcoming, your future self and, and kind of predetermining your own future self by taking some control over those variables. Here, it's a kind of a semantic game maybe, but it depends what you mean by volition. I don't think it's semantic, but I just wouldn't confuse predictability in the sense of being able to do the calculation with some kind of volition, which to me is a ghost in the machine. If it's not the particles and laws of physics, if you're saying there's something else, you got to tell me what that something else is. And I know you well enough to know that you don't think there's anything else. No, no, yeah. no, of course not. No, so but, but, but self-awareness, awareness of the factors. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm going to bring in Eric here. So Eric, uh, Lee Smolin, he's described where we're at in physics at the moment with the, the, the principles that, that Brian's talking about here that... that infers everything. He's described physicists as like biologists before Darwin, that we're, we're, we're missing a really big picture. So, so, so what's, what's your thoughts on this? You know, we're, we're, we're in danger of spending the hour on the issue of computability and effective theories. And, and I, I think everybody's probably agreed. There is no way in theory, even Brian will not say that the computation is possible. You can show that the system can't compute itself. So let's agree that um, the first issue is that we have to understand that the theory of everything, if it is to be given meaning and to evade Brian's criticism, has to be narrowed. It's not the colloquial sense. It has to do with finding the rules of chess if the universe was chess by observing chess games. It doesn't tell you how to play chess and it doesn't necessarily tell you who created chess, right? So what I've tried to say concretely is, is that I believe um, that our, our particular universe, and just to give you grist for actual debate where we, where we will disagree, um, I am betting that the universe uh, is determined by a four-dimensional orientable manifold with a unique spin structure, that that would be sufficient to generate three families of uh, 
fermions with the observed quantum numbers, um, as well as geometric laws for the metric. And also just to um, possibly give some region for debate, uh, I would also say that quantum gravity is not the only way of harmonizing uh, the standard model with Einstein's theory of general relativity necessarily, and that there was a little bit of a three-card Monty um, played in the late 70s, early 80s, where we went from unified field theory towards quantum gravity, which very much favored quantum field theorists and the, what used to be high energy physics, which has now become no energy physics, because most of it isn't really about physics at all. I mean, were we to read through the archive today, uh, none of us could contain our sense of embarrassment of doing this in front of a thousand people. So I think that uh, that's our paper repository. I think that the important thing to say is that a theory of everything as a physical theory is one which demotivates physicists to keep working on the problem of the rules of chess if the universe was chess and hands it over to philosophers. We, we don't know where the number seven comes from but I know very few mathematicians who spend their time worrying about the origin of that numeral. So I think that it's very important to actually understand that the most audacious thing that we can say is that we are extremely close uh, in some of our estimations to a theory of everything pro um, properly scoped so as not to include the issue of effective theories, computation, or the origins of an initial set. I don't think that, you, you, and Catherine, you actually entered the debate when you said that in your initial statement. So I think you're now a participant. Um, and I, I heartily disagree with your opening statement that it should contain itself. In fact, um, it, should, it, that it should go over to the philosophers and theologians to ask uh, what the initial conditions are all about. And, and by the way, by initial, I don't mean in time because time itself is part of the story. I think what, I, what I'm really trying to say is you have to postulate that there is something rather than nothing and then the idea is, is that no physicist should be motivated to continue that search. Aspina, I'm going to bring you in here because uh, you've, been, you've been uncharacteristically quiet until this point. <laughs> so um, I think you'll agree with some of the things that Eric just said, but, but not all. Yeah, so, but I think I, I'm going to do the boring thing and will try to actually answer the question which you ask whether theory can explain itself. Uh, my answer would be uh, not within the confines uh, of science to begin with, because the purpose of science is to explain observations. The purpose of science is not to explain the theories that are supposed to explain uh, the observations um, unless i mean you 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 mean this in the colloquial sense like that i'm trying to explain to you how quantum mechanics works that kind of thing uh but it, there's also another way to see what the problem is um so uh one of the requirements we have of a um, theory of everything a fundamental theory of nature is that it's internally consistent which is exactly what we currently don't have like if we just take all those four interactions uh, uh, standard model and, and, and gravity and we throw them together that's not internally consistent which which is why we think there has to be a theory of quantum gravity um but um if you only have this requirement of consistency there are lots of theories out there you know there are lots of sets of axioms that are um axiomatically consistent and their only shortcoming is that they don't describe what we see you know you you can make up a theory about an empty universe that doesn't contain any matter and there wouldn't be anything wrong with it other than that it's not the universe we inhabit uh, which means that whatever this theory is this theory of everything um, some of the answers it will give is just it's because that's what we observe because we need this to pick one specific theory. The universe is one way and not another, um, basically. So this is why I think um, a theory of, that describes everything we observe would still have some unanswered questions, um, just because it will have certain ingredients that we had to pick to describe uh, what we observe. One of the things that I think might be interesting uh, for Sabina and I to chew over is I actually think that it's not just uh, to explain experiment. A really good theory should actually challenge things that we think we know to be true that turn out are not true. And one of the things that I find very interesting is the number of theories that are as timid as possible, like you know, a sterile neutrino theory, which attempts to say as little beyond the standard model and gravity uh, as we can. So I think that a really good theory should actually point and say, do you, are you, how sure are you about all these things you think you've observed? 
furthermore, um, I think that it's also possible, you know, I heard Sabina say uh, quantum gravity. Uh, if you think about going in the opposite direction, Einstein's theory was initially geometric, uh, whereas the, uh, the quantum depended on calculus and linear algebra. And what really happened is we went in exactly the opposite direction. We didn't quantize gravity. We geometrized the quantum from the period of the early to mid 70s through this explosion, uh, largely due to the string theorists not doing string theory, but instead geometrizing quantum field theory in the 80s and 90s. And so really, um, things have been going in the other direction where the children of Einstein have been um, more effective at transforming the uh, thinking process of the children of Bohr. And so I think instead of thinking about quantum gravity, we should uh, pull back and say we, we, we need to harmonize the two theories rather than force gravity to submit to the quantum. Thank you, Eric. Well, if I if I can briefly um, if I can briefly respond to this, uh, I, I actually agree. I think this is this is an issue of terminology. So when I say quantum gravity, I don't necessarily mean you have to quantize gravity. But as any kind of theory that resolves the inconsistency between the quantized quantum field theories and gravity. Thanks, Sabina. So uh, we have uh, uh, the highlight talk after our debate this evening by Michio Kaku, and he's very focused on the history of physics, the fact that it can be characterized by unification. So, of course, we have um, Newton with the theory of the heavens, uh, fantastic Maxwell uh, unifying um, electromagnetism. And, and Brian, I know, you know you've, you've spent your life working on string theory, which is looking at unifying electromagnetism, the strong and the weak theory. You know, why do you think historically we have been so fixated on, on trying to get this theory of everything? Um, you know, you, you've been working on this for 30 years, Brian, so you must be slightly fixated on it. Well, first off, I wouldn't say that the goal of string theory is to unify all the forces of nature. I would say that's an interesting byproduct of the theory. The real motivation for string theory is what we just heard from Eric and Sabine. It's a particular approach to trying to resolve this incompatibility between the traditional formulation of quantum mechanics and the traditional formulation of the general theory of relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity. And string theory is simply one approach which, at least on paper, shows great promise to blend these two theories into a mathematically consistent framework. Now, when you study that theory in detail, you can extract a very satisfying unification that does continue the work of, of Newton and the work of Faraday and Maxwell and the work of Salam and, and Weinberg and Glashow because it does naturally put together the fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the weak and strong nuclear forces, and gravity, they're all put together into one unified rubric. They're all the result of certain kinds of vibrations of this hypothetical ingredient called a string. So it's not the motivation, it's really the, the outcome. But I will say that I certainly agree with you that historically, even beyond physics, we do see a kind of human drive toward unity. And maybe, maybe Michael can give us the philosophical or evolutionary psychological reason for that. I mean, you can see that in the world's religions, right? There's a time when many of the world's religions had many different deities, and then at some point, some religions tend to consolidate and come to a monotheistic, a unification, if you will, of those kinds of forces. And, you know, I, I even had a, I did a program just the other day on something non-physics at all. It's about psychedelics okay and the people that i was talking to who are deeply involved in psychedelics they see psychedelics as a unified theory of everything of human consciousness it's as if you know any area that you're within you talk to a priest religion's a unified theory of everything so i think there's a human tendency for a desire for our ideas of the moment to have incredibly large explanatory reach so maybe that's part of the drive but for string theory and for physics more generally, it's more what Sabina was saying. We have certain data about the world. We're trying to explain that data in the most straightforward and predictive means possible. We come up with certain mathematical theories, quantum mechanics and general relativity, the standard model being among those. And we want those theories to talk to each other in a mathematically consistent way. And at the moment, they don't. 
Now the world's a consistent place, so our description needs to be consistent, and that is really what motivates us to try to go the next step. And again, string theory is just one possible way that may or may not be the way to do that. Thanks, Brian. Eric, do you feel fixated in the search of the theory of everything? You know, you said quite confidently at the start that you believed that it was possible to find one and you have your, your own theory. Look, the answer to this question changed in 1952. Uh, in less than six months between 1952 and 1953, um, we successfully fused nuclei and caused an island in the Pacific to disappear as well as we entered the cell and found the three-dimensional structure of DNA and the genetic code 10 years after. Um, we're going to die here very soon. And by soon, I mean a few hundred years at most, almost certainly. We're having a, a cigar party uh, and a fireworks display while perched on a propane tank. Um, you can see from, for example, the fact that we're all wearing these masks, people haven't even figured out that they're going to have to buy hazmat suits if we start having thermonuclear exchanges. I'm not kidding at all about this. Um, so the new reason to do this isn't the beauty of gazing into the night sky or man's quest to know uh, his place in the universe. If we don't figure out how to spread out, we are running one single experiment with godlike powers and the wisdom of morons uh, based on our current political leadership. There is no way that this terminates well. Furthermore, there is no faster than light travel inside of general relativity. So you can look up at the night sky and you can know more or less that unless you're betting on time dilation and other exotic effects and wormholes, uh, we aren't going any place. There are only three habitable spheres. Now, the world's richest people, two of them, Bezos and, and Musk, are focused on rockets to get us into space. One of us thinks that we can diversify with three spheres. The other seems to think that Gerald K. O'Neill's circular space stations with artificial gravity are the way to go. Bezos actually makes more sense. Neither of these make much sense at all. Um, and the odd thing to say, and again, you know, I don't want to go too much into social commentary, is, is that um, if we could only get physics to be vaguely phallic in shape, load it with high explosives and oxidizers, we could get fully funded. And I think we'd probably have a theory within 20 years. At the moment, nobody seems to be motivated on the idea that you break it, you bought it. Physics has a ton of social responsibility. Uh, we unleashed this power. I, I encourage everyone to read Edward Teller's letter to Leo Zillard at the end of the Manhattan Project and to reevaluate their theories of Edward Teller. His idea was is that war had to become so unthinkable that we could never have another. And 75 years of this peace have dulled our sensibilities, forgetting that nuclear weapons have not gone away and we've added biologicals. If we're not very careful, we are gonna have to go farther through the valley of death that physics has led us into if we are ever to escape, diversify, and have some hope that some of us at least will make it in the long term. Oh, Eric. I went off on a tangent from the theory of everything, but I'm feeling a bit depressed now. Um, <laughs> Sabina, we have a chance to survive, Catherine. You have an opportunity because you know Hamiltonian dynamics and Lagrangians and all that to work on an escape plan. In fact, I would say we have an obligation um, to, uh, I think T Teller's comment was uh, to tie the toe of the genie from the bottle we helped it to escape. If the theory of everything exists, it renders Einstein and, and uh, the standard model as effective theories to be deduced from the underlying theory. We don't know whether an analog of the prohibition on faster than light travel persists into a lower layer until we have such a theory. So it could be that if you had the theory of everything, you could prove that you will never meaningfully escape the solar system. Eric is saying that it, we must pursue this theory of everything because, because <laughs> the, fundamentally humanity needs to escape and go somewhere else. Diversify. Yeah. Well, um, so I'm I'm doing something very shocking now. I'll actually I'll actually agree with Eric, uh, which is that I I think physicists totally underestimate their responsibility, uh, and I think the the relevance of the foundations of physics at this point in the history of time is totally underestimated. You know, we need some new technologies. We're kind of running out of ideas here, and I think they have to come from the foundations of physics. Now, where we start to disagree is, uh, is exactly where those new ideas uh, should be coming from. And um, I don't really think that 
quantum gravity is the right direction to look. I've I've worked for a long time on quantum gravity. Um, I I don't think that looking for mathematical consistency is the right thing to do, but we should be looking for um, experimental evidence. And I, I can talk about this for some time. Uh, but the point is that all those effects of quantum gravity, they're like really, really small. And even though I think they're they're super important to understand the universe, I can't really see that they're going to be technologic technologically relevant in the near future, which is why as of recently, I'm more working in the direction of the foundations of uh, quantum mechanics, where we're talking about the measurement problem, because quantum mechanics is the theoretical framework that underlies all our current technology. And if we understand this better, if we figure out that this is not fundamentally the right thing to do, that's going to impact all our technologies and is almost certainly going uh, to lead to applications. Thanks, Savina. Now, Michael, Eric's just up the ante here saying we need a theory of everything to, to diversify and, and save humanity. So, so where is that? If, if, if we're really here to pursue that, where is that theory of everything going to come from and you've wrote a really interesting review of uh, Margaret Wertheim's book recently um, where you were saying that you were becoming less dismissive of these these theories of everything that you were being sent that maybe mainstream academic academic physics is is, is not the place to, to look at these things I wonder if you want to mm, uh, expand on that right thought. Yeah, well, first, uh, thanks for the cheery uh, Monday morning, Eric. <laughs> We're all doomed. We only have a couple centuries to go. We got to go to Mars and, and and start a new human colony. I do support that idea just in case, but not, not just in case we uh, cause our own extinction, which is unlikely, but not impossible with nuclear weapons. I think, you know, it's just what we do as a species. We expand out and we explore new uh, places and that's the next logical step. So let's do it. Okay, good. Um, but if it was just for saving our our species, uh, we'd be far better putting the money into research on game theory, for example, and how po uh, political leaders can solve conflicts or how nations can solve conflicts. And what's the best structure for governance of a collection of people to reduce or attenuate the possibility of of uh, you know massive conflict that could then escalate to using nuclear weapons because we can't unlearn nuclear physics and you know somebody on Mars five thousand years from now could reinvent nuclear weapons because the knowledge is there uh, so it's better to I think to put it in the human realm of how do we prevent people from having those sorts of conflicts that could ever escalate uh, to nuclear conflict and 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 there we've actually made a lot of progress we we know we understand why. Uh, leaders do what they do. and uh, But maybe there's a completely different, uh, say, say, I don't know if you call it a theory of everything in politics, but let's say I wrote this essay called Governing Mars. So, all right, what kind of govern governance should we take with us? Well, we've learned a lot here on Earth, on the blue planet. So maybe we should take the best of what we have to the red planet. But maybe... Elon's engineers or his social scientists or whoever, uh, or, or the Martians themselves centuries from now will come up with some completely different way of structuring the economy and political systems that we can't even think of. That's way better than democracy. Democracy is great, you know, but it's, you know, it's not perfect. So maybe there's something that, that none of us can think of. And there, I would like to say we should have funding for that. You know, just like, OK, you think of something completely new that no one's ever thought of. OK, second part to your, to your question, I think, is an epistemological one. How do you know if somebody's theory of everything is has any hope for succeeding here? I have a lot of experience in this because, uh, you know, most of these theories of everything I get are in the physical sciences. And I always ask them, why are you asking me? I, I, I'm a social scientist, historian. So I don't know anything about physics. You know, go, why don't you take it to Kip Thorne at Caltech and ask him or Michio Kaku or Brian or whatever? And uh, they, oh, they will never accept it because, you know, they're, they're flatlanders and, you know, scientists are dogmatic and closed minded and they can never accept new ideas. Well, if that was true, there'd be no progress in science. So obviously it's not true. So there's a reason for why scientists tend to be skeptical of theories of everything or any kind of uh, sort of fringe or, or new idea that's challenging the mainstream. And, and that, that is because most new ideas are wrong. 
including those by brilliant scientists. You know, scientists are often just spitballing ideas, just trying to come up with stuff that they can test and, and just see how it and float it out there to see how it goes. And most of the time it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Stephen Wolfram, who was the youngest PhD ever at Caltech, a super brilliant guy, Mathematica and so on. He wrote this book called A New Kind of Science. And so uh, to my utter surprise, he, his office called me and said, well, he'd like to meet with you. I was like, me? Okay. So, uh, and what do you want to know is as a story of science, how do scientific revolutions come about? Because I kind of like to bring out my own scientific revolution with my new kind of science. It's like, it doesn't come from the top down. You can't just like orchestrate it. You just, your ideas either lead to some new fruitful research and other ideas by graduate students and other professors, whatever, or it doesn't. And usually it doesn't go anywhere. And, uh, and he's like, oh, okay. Hmm. And, you know, sort of following his work again, brilliant guy, wonderful ideas and so on. I, I don't, I don't think it's changed the science. It, it either does or it doesn't. So there, the best you could do is just kind of put it out there to your colleagues and, and hope that it changes the way they think. And if it doesn't, well, that's just the way it goes. It probably, it's probably not a fruitful idea. Mm. Now, now, Eric, I'm going to bring you in here because you, you aren't coming from mainstream academia. You, you do, of course, have a PhD in mathematical physics, but your, your theory of everything hasn't gone through the peer review process that, that, the, the normal academic circle. So what, what's your, your thought on this? Is science being um, slowed down by the academic pressures? Do we need to pay more attention to, um, to non-mainstream ideas? Well, most non-mainstream ideas are lousy. And um, no, they are. And most mainstream, I mean, look, the, the, the community that um, I've been most angry with, the string theory community, uh, is not because string theory is a bad idea. There's nothing that the equations aren't going to hurt you. And the ideas aren't going to hurt you. It's just a, the 80s version of string theory was murderous. The whole point was we've got this. There are only five theories. We'll, we'll go through them and then we'll tell you the answer. And everybody else is just a poser. And they've not atoned for that sin and it poisoned the entire culture. Now that poisoning didn't happen uniquely within physics, unless you cross fields and unless you've released the theory of everything, you have no idea of the current state of academics. I just called, for example, Peter Woit, who runs the blog, not even wrong, and is a colleague of Brian's at Columbia. And, you know, of course I'd read his new foray into the world of theories of everything. Um, as I read Stephen Wolfram's and Garrett Lisi's and every one of these, and in general, everyone who releases one has the same reaction, which is even if you come from a, a position where you have a PhD and you, you come from the mainstream, the issue of reputational dynamics is such that everyone is looking for a kill shot. How do I make Peter White go away so I never have to listen to him again? How do I protect my <laughs> precious reputation so that um, effectively... Uh, I can dismiss my colleagues and continue to stay in the game because the main product here is, is that we have a certain amount of prestige. Now, I've made the decision that you cannot actually pursue this within the academic community. Stephen Wolfram has bounced out having a, a, a company to support his research. Garrett Lisi has uh, made shrewd investments. Julian Barbour translates things. The, the problem is that we've had a catastrophe in the culture of academics due to the fact that it had a period of rapid expansion. And when that came to an end, it became sort of the a Ponzi scheme meets the hunger games. So what you find out when you release one of these things is, is that nobody is really taking these theories seriously. Sabina, why are people not taking this stuff seriously? Well, because I mean, so it depends on exactly what you're talking about. I think that the different theories of everything have different problems. Um, like, I mean, for example, like the your random engineer who writes to me, uh, I don't take this seriously because those are normally people who don't understand the problem they're trying to solve in the first place. Uh, they don't reach the scientific standard uh, or in many cases um, what's actually happening is that they are reinventing an idea that physicists have discarded long ago because they understood that it doesn't work so that this happens more often than uh, than you may think now um, if i may add a little historical perspective uh, i think what's happened in the foundations of physics is um, that we had all those successes coming from unification 
um, which um, Michael and, and Brian were already alluding to earlier. Um, so we unified the electric and the magnetic force to the electromagnetic, and then we had the uh, electroweak unification, and now we have the standard model uh, and gravity. And we've had this since the 1970s. And um, at that moment in time, the reasonable thing to do was to go for an even bigger unification, right? Because that had worked before. And that's exactly what physicists um, did. They um, developed string theory for, for a different purpose, but then they figured out, okay, it contains something that looks like gravity. Maybe that'll do the trick. And then there were also those ideas of grand unified uh, theories um, that made some predictions that people looked for in the 1980s, for example, that protons should decay, but protons were not seen to decay and those theories were ruled out and uh, string theory, well, we, we know how this went, right? It, it never made any concrete predictions. Uh, and then was kind of supersymmetry was kind of outsourced and that made some predictions run into conflict with experiments and then it was um, amended and then now it's run into conflict with experiment again and now people are fudging it again. And I, I think the problem we have in academia there is that people tried something and it didn't work and they didn't get the message and now they're just trying the same thing over and over and over again and it still doesn't work. So I agree that we need some uh, some new ideas, uh, some new inspiration, just to that people stop doing the same thing over and over again and inventing some new particles which are then never found. It's just not going anywhere. Okay, Eric, very briefly. This is a primary confusion. We have ideas and we have instantiations. Let's just take what Sabina said about grand unified theories. The original SU5 grand unified theory predicted proton decay at a particular scale. We didn't see it when we filled up a mine uh, with fluid to look for this. It doesn't rule out the Petit Salam theory. It doesn't rule out different versions of it. And in the case of supersymmetry, supersymmetry is an abstract idea. What we've invalidated is various instantiations of an abstract idea, and we've pushed it into a realm of unnaturality. Now, Sabine is quite correct that most of these people become very attached to whatever they've said because it, it, it fixes to their ego. We all are in danger of this. But the idea that's really important is what happens if, for example, the affine space you're supposed to be trying this on is not Minkowski space, but the space of connections. That would be a different instantiation. What if the right group uh, to be looking at is a different version? Dirac, in his 1963 Scientific American art, pointed out that Schrodinger um, his initial formulation and instantiation was wrong, but the theory was right. Uh, the key problem is, is that we have to give up on bad instantiations and continue to push the ideas that have yet to find their correct instantiation. Thank you, Eric. Brian, is it possible to imagine a future where academics will agree on a theory of everything? And I think you already started off saying there is no such thing as a theory of everything, but please give us your concluding thoughts, Brian. Well, bringing us back from theory of everything to the kind of theory that we've really been focusing upon in this conversation, some sort of unified description of the fundamental laws, the fundamental particles, putting gravity into the story, putting quantum mechanics into the story, I do think that it's quite possible and indeed likely that there will come a point where we do have the theory that the majority of the academic community will agree upon. Now, some would suggest that we're further along that road than perhaps some of the other discussants today would agree on. Is string theory that theory? I don't know. Nobody does. But I will say that this general view that string theory is stagnant or somehow its main role is to keep string theorists employed and to keep other voices and other ideas out of the discussion certainly doesn't resonate or align with my experience over the past 30 years. My experience is that physicists are generally interested in heading toward the truth and are open to ideas that really feel like they're doing that. And so if someone comes along tomorrow with a mathematical proof that string theory that we thought was internally consistent mathematically, if there's a real flaw that kills string theory mathematically, the community will not try to continue to support it if it's a convincing argument. The community will move on because most of us, or perhaps I should speak for myself, think you go around once, you live once, 
And our goal is to contribute to this inexorable drive toward a deeper understanding of the world. And if string theory is not that theory, I would love to know that today, if there's a proof that shows that the mathematics doesn't work, and I'd be willing to drop it completely and move on. Now, that hasn't happened. I suspect it won't happen. But indeed, the general psychological orientation of most of us is, let us try to press forward to a deeper understanding of the world. That's what matters. Thank you, Brian. And thank you so, so much to my four speakers this evening who were just simply fantastic. There wasn't enough time, really, was there to debate. But um, we will carry on. <laughs> thank you, everyone.